Was the temple structure really excited to see what Peter and John did? That's what we're going to find out next in Acts 4. All right, so it said that they were speaking to the people and the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them and were annoyed because they were teaching people and proclaiming Jesus and the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them. Jesus told them they were going to be arrested and brought before leaders, before synagogues, boy, put them in custody for the next day. And it was already evening, so many people had already heard and believed. And the number of men who came to believe was about 5,000. So that also means maybe equal number of women and children as well. So apparently the temple structure was not terribly excited. Again, they probably thought, we killed Jesus, this is the end of it. And now they're seeing this is just building momentum. And Peter is still talking about Jesus as the Messiah. It's not like Peter is now taking on this mantle and saying, look at me. Nope, this is still the same Jesus that they crucified. And, you know, I think it's interesting in, in that sense that the Sadducees had Oh, I would say looser beliefs. The Pharisees were, we have to make sure that we don't do any work when three stars appear on the horizon because that's what we're defining as sunset. They were very careful to believe everything they could possibly believe and then build rules around the rules. The Sadducees were like not so tied up to things. And so you would almost guess that they would be like, well, whatever. This guy believes something different. We believe something different. Who cares? But the problem was, is they were political. They wanted this attachment to the Roman Empire. When you've been sacked as many times as the Jewish nation had been sacked by the Assyrians and the Babylonians and everyone that they've been attacked by, Rome seems pretty stable. They're highly educated. They probably appreciated the attention to learning and this metropolitan view of worldliness and trade and the Pax Romana, which, you know, was at its height at this particular time, they were probably like, this is a good deal for us. And we don't want any kind of unrest. We don't want to go anywhere that's going to disturb it. You know, so the Pharisees are going to be upset because they're like, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. What chapter and verse did it say this in? No, no, that's not what that's about. The Sadducees were more like, Let's not upset this apple cart. We got things pretty good right now. So they put Peter and John into prison. And it says that the next day, because it's already late, the rulers, the elders, the scribes all gathered in Jerusalem. And Annas, the high priest, and, and Caiaphas, and John and Alexander, who were all part of the high priest family, talked together. And they said they inquired, by what name are you doing this? And it says, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. So we have the gift of the Holy Spirit when Jesus breathed on them. And Jesus brought in Pentecost the Holy Spirit to all believers. This is a special filling. He is particularly filled with the Holy Spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit is going to tell him what to say. It's going to help him with memory. It's going to praise Jesus and praise God. So they're trying again. I mean, we, we saw that question come of Jesus. Well, what power do you do this? Well, what, what power was John baptizing in? We asked this question about whose power are you doing this in? Because the first reaction is we're going to accuse you of worshiping the devil and demons and being demon possessed. They're trying to get into the same trap they had already been in with Jesus before. They asked that same question in Luke chapter 20, verse 2. And so Peter says, rulers of the people and elders, if we are examined today concerning a good deed we did for that man, let you all know, and all the people of Israel know, it was Jesus of Nazareth. Peter wasn't taking credit himself. Again, if the New Testament was some sort of propaganda piece to say how great the apostles were, nope. They're saying, Jesus did this. Jesus of Nazareth did this. You crucified. God raised him from the dead. And by the man who's standing in front of you, this action happened, but not by me. Jesus was a stone that was rejected by you builders, you know, and, and now he is the cornerstone and their salvation in no one else, for there is no other name in heaven given by men 
by which we must be saved. Right there. This is not, you can just praise God in any way you see fit. There is no other name. This is the only name. This is the only way. Jesus is the only truth, the only life, and the only way. Peter is being very clear about this. You think you're praying to God. So if you're a builder, you're analyzing all the stones you have in front of you, and you're going to say, well, which stone are we going to put where? The cornerstone is the thing holding up the whole building. And you rejected this stone, but now this stone is holding up this whole building. There was even some comments about Jesus being the stone that if you trip on, you get crushed by, all those things. And when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, who were hicks or uneducated common men, they were astonished because they were astonished when Jesus did it. But now these guys too? And, and, and then looking at the man who just got healed, they had nothing to say in opposition. I mean, what do you say? We're sorry this man got healed? I mean, you would think that any human being, if, if someone got cured of cancer who was going to die of cancer, would we not rejoice in that? If we saw someone who could not walk, but suddenly they could, wow, that is amazing. But instead, they're just sitting there and trying to find fault with it. What can we say against this? So they, they couldn't. There was nothing they really could say. So they commanded them to leave the consul, and then they conferred with each other. You know, they're mumbling to each other. And what should we do? This is a big sign. This was evident in all of the people here in Jerusalem, and we can't deny it because so many people saw it. And what can we do to prevent this from spreading even more? Again, if we saw someone cured by cancer, right? Ooh, what can we do to stop that from spreading? We would hope that we would rejoice in someone being healed like this, that we would want it to spread further, that we would want more people to be healed. But in this case, nope, they didn't want this to spread any further. So they said, okay, fine, we'll just warn them to shut up. So they call them back in and said, don't talk about this. And Peter and John says, we're going to speak of this. We're going to say everything because we have to, you know, you can go ahead and judge us, but we cannot do anything but speak about what we have seen and heard. And when they got further threatened, they let them go. There's no way they could punish them. I mean, they already pulled this card with Pilate once. Are they going to pull it again and try to get these two crucified as well? Probably not going to work. And again, so many people saw it. So they threatened them some more. It says, because of people who are all praising God, for whom the sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. I mean, that was really old. This is not an age when you get better in that time. You're not going to be lame and then be able to walk again when you're 40. Because when you're 40, it's kind of like, eh, you're getting up there in age at this particular time. This is, I thought was really good, is that, so, so they were released and they went to their friends and told them what the chief priests and the elders said to them. And they lifted their voices, it said, together it, to God, sovereign Lord who made heaven and earth and the seas and everything in them, who the mouth of our father David, your servant, said the Holy Spirit, And now we're quoting Psalm 2, where it said, Why did the Gentiles rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers gathered together against the Lord and against the anointed one. That's going to be his Messiah. So we're now quoting Psalms. And they praised God for this. They all gathered together against Jesus the anointed one, Herod, Pontius, the Gentiles, the people of Israel, everyone came together. What do they pray? Not for protection, not for those people to go away and leave them alone. I mean, I could think of all the things I would pray if I just had that experience, but instead they said, no, let us continue to be bold and stretch out your hands and heal and signs of wonders and perform things through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they prayed, and the place was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to say the word of God with boldness, it says. You know, I think it's interesting because like we saw, well, we haven't seen yet, but Solomon asked for that right thing, make me wise. And God, I think, enjoyed that request. I'm going to make you the wisest man on earth. In this case, like I said, they didn't ask for protection. Hey, Jesus, could you give us all plane tickets so we can get out of here? Because this is obviously too hot 
of a place to be in right now. Nope. Make us more bold. Make us say these things. Fill us with your Holy Spirit so we can eat tell more people. And I think God honored that and again, filled them with the Holy Spirit and that boldness continued. Now it said again, everyone was of one heart, one soul. No one said anything about that belonging to, hey, that's my sandwich, you know, anything like that. They shared everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony of the resurrection of the Lord and grace was upon them all. Not a needy person among them because people sold their land, sold their houses, anyone who was in need. And then it said it was distributed to the people who had the need. Thus, Joseph, who was also called by the apostles, Barnabas, son of encouragement, a Levite, native of Cyprus, sold one of his fields and gave him the money and laid it at the apostles' feet so that they could use it. And so this brings up just kind of some interesting points in all of this, is that first of all, some people will point to this and say, this is communism. This is the start. This is why communism must take root because it started right here. This isn't communism because communism is a government telling people they must do this. There is a lot of communal living that happens voluntarily, that happens because we decide to do it. Just like when we have family, do we charge our children for their dinner? Do we charge grandparents for coming over to our dinner? Do we share with our friends? Do we bring things to breakfast at our church so that people can have a good breakfast before the church service? There are many times that we share communally. Not only that, but with the church giving to the poor and helping those in poor. Voluntary, done out of goodwill, done by us, not done at the point of a gun or at the point of arrest. We are doing this voluntarily. Second, I think that the other interesting point is some people will say that because Jesus came and died. He fulfilled the old covenants and they're no more. We aren't Jewish and we don't have to go to temple and we don't have to follow the Jewish holidays if we don't want to. We don't have to celebrate them in the same way, but it is our heritage. I think it's interesting. I think it's interesting when you can go to a Passover Seder, but obviously the words of the prophets, the words of the Torah, Moses and Abraham, they're still there. We are in this long chain that started at Genesis and went through the Torah, went through the prophets, went through John the Baptist, the last of the Old Testament prophets, and then Jesus in the New Testament. This is a continual faith and with a new covenant that was given to us by Jesus. So I think it's interesting, but you can see that right away, Peter was still going to the temple because he's a Jewish man. He still was quoting the scriptures because they are still part of our heritage. So it wasn't a completion of that either. And then the other part of it is, is look at this blessing that God is doing. So what I'm going to meditate this week is about how people try to solve the problem of Jesus, right? That you will hear modern day people, well, if we could just get past this religious thing, we're going to be just fine and we're going to have this modern world And it'll be amazing because we won't have the stupid face stuff. How many people tried to get rid of Jesus, get rid of the faith before Jesus and the faith after Jesus? And it doesn't work. The Romans tried it. The Pharisees tried it. The Sadducees tried it. The Greeks tried it. The Babylonians tried it. You know, all these people tried it. It doesn't work. God's word thrives, even in times of great peril. And what I'm going to pray about is having that boldness, not only, I said before, to speak the truth of God, but when under accusations, I guess, under pressure not to say the right things, to always have that boldness to look authority in the face and say the right thing. And what I'm going to share with others is the fact that this message of Jesus continued. It never stopped. It would have been very easy to stop right here. Jesus dies. He hangs on the cross. We're all scared to death. A little girl threatened Peter. We all ran off into the Galilee to go fishing. We could have just ended it right there and and, and been the end of it. They couldn't because they saw Jesus for 40 more days. They saw a resurrected Lord and the Holy Spirit empowered this church 
to keep going and keep thriving. Like I said, it was like that guy I talked to in Jerusalem. If there were 80 people claiming to be the Messiah at the time of Jesus, how come Jesus is the one name we know? Because he's the one who came out of the grave. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for listening to the podcast. I appreciate it. I hope that you tell a friend that you could tell your Bible study or anything else. If you have a group or a Christian radio station or someone that you would love for me to speak to or talk about my experience, I'd be happy to do it. You can always email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you.